morning. Welcome to the Rapid City Seventh Day Adventist Church this morning. It's good to see so many of you people up. It's a beautiful Sabbath day. I'm thankful for that. I'm, I feel kind of stressed with everything that's going on in the world right now, but we have to remember that God is guiding and leading us, and He will give us strength. This morning I have a few announcements to make. One that I'm pleased to announce that we're going to have the second reading for Robert Hamill for uh, Ed Deacon. And uh, do we have, this is the second reading, I would like a motion that we allow him to be Ed Deacon. So have a motion. Have a motion, do we have a second? Have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, for stepping forward and doing this. We're pleased to have you. Um, Barbara's told me that if, if you're going to pass out treats tonight, she's got some uh, bag stuffers of uh, junior guides and primaries and little friends, and they're over there on the piano if you'd like to help yourself. She's going to put in your bags tonight. And also, uh, another announcement that uh, the kids' party has been canceled, so there is no kids' party here tonight. And uh, we have an announcement by Michelle. I just wanted to let everyone know that the Winter Fruit Program is coming to an end. You have two more weeks until November 13th to place your orders, and it's online. The brochures are in the back there. If you have any questions, you can call me. There's lots of fruit. There's 14 different varieties of boxes that you can order. You don't have to be local to order um, because it's shipped directly to your house. So feel free to share with your friends, families, extended family um, to get their orders in. Thank you. I'm thankful somebody stepped forward to doing that program. Uh, let's let's open our service this morning with an invocation. So would you bow your head with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can gather here this morning to worship you on this your beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for the tranquility we feel this morning, the peace that we have in our hearts that you will soon return and take us home with you. We ask that you come into our service this morning and you accept our worship. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It's time to take up the offering. Uh, it's for a secondary endowment I think we only take this up once a year, but it's for secondary education, it's for our education program. And, uh, before Jesus left this planet, he made a promise that he would never leave us alone or forsake us. And that's a promise that we really need to hang on to this morning. He would send another helper or comforter. The spirit of truth would live in us to guide and con convict of us of what is right and what is wrong and remind us of the consequences of our choices. The Holy Spirit teaches and helps us to remember the things we've learned. And that's a wonderful promise too because the older you get, the more your mind kind of likes to forget things. Today the gifts we give to our bring to our worship will support our uh, church's many activities, especially secondary education. Let's continue to pray that the Holy Spirit will guide and direct our church and our leaderships and all its in initiatives that brings uh, that together we can accomplish great things for the kingdom of God for eternity. Let's pray. <clears throat> 
Father, we thank you for the promises of the Holy Spirit, and we thank you for the provision you have made to empower and guide your people. Bless, please bless us with a fresh fulfilling of the Holy Spirit as we present these gifts to you. Grant wisdom, discernment, and boldness to our mission of spreading the gospel. And as we partner with each other today to bring this about, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
So she gives her a sandwich and some food. And the lady thanks her and leaves. And then pretty soon, Mrs. Cole hears a knock on her door. And she comes to the door, she opens the door, and she's like, you dear lady, come in. And sat her down at the table and got a nice plate of food ready for her. And the lady, the old lady said, can I please take this with me? That's fine. So she boxed it up and gave it to her. And the lady, old lady left. Well, later that day, Mrs. Apple, Mrs. Brown, and Mrs. Cole got a note to come for supper at this rich lady's house. And they had no idea what it was going to be about. But they got there, and she greeted them, and they visited her a bit, and then they went into the dining room. And what do you think they saw on the place, on the table? What kind of dinner? I'm sorry. Food. What kind of food? Mrs. Apple seeing some toast and a cup of water at her place. Mrs. Brown seeing a sandwich and piece of fruit at her place. And Mrs. Cole seeing the nice plate of food that they had given the old beggar woman. And they were looking at each other and looking at the rich lady. And she said, I am old and I don't have any children to take my money and I chose, decided to give my money to one of you. Now which one do you think she gave it to? <laughs> Mrs. Cole. And that reminds me of a story that Jesus told in the Bible about how different, three different men were given money by their master and when he came back, they were rewarded based on what they had done. And we also, it also reminds me of the story of the Samaritan. So let's remember to be kind to others even if we don't know who they are. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for the examples that you told us in the Bible and that have come down to us about being kind to others. And I ask that you will help us to be understanding and willing to be your life wherever we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Take away the clouds of darkness from our understanding, so the sun of righteousness will shine in the recesses of our mind. We desire this morning to make a total surrender to you, to give up our will, to give up our ways and our course of action that has not been in harmony with your ways. We ask for your forgiveness of our sins. We acknowledge that we need to be broken in heart and mind and made rich in your love and your understanding. We pray for this world, Lord. We know that this world was not the plan that you had for your created people. But with the uncertainty of life at this time, we are dependent on you and your wisdom and your power. Give us faith in you and your ability to carry your people through this earth's uh, troubling times and uncertainties. And keep us ever mindful that you are going to return for us. Help us, Lord, to keep looking up in anticipation. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. songs for us and then they're going to show us a, a short video and after that we're going to have a, another video um, I'm not 100% certain what it's all about but I think uh, Neil Billoff is going to give us his final message for because he has retired now and he wanted to let the video message for us so Right after the church school, we'll have that. Thank you.
when you're looking up there. We're also involved in doing Operation Christmas Child. Some of you have heard about it before. It's where students are able to pack a box full of some things, and that box gets sent to a third world country, to a child overseas somewhere. And it's the closest thing I can think of to letting our kids be missionaries. Um, they have an opportunity once they receive that box over there to come to some vacation Bible school type of meetings where they learn more about Jesus. So Operation Christmas Child is actually uh, a way that children in third world countries can learn more about Jesus. So we're excited about being able to share uh, that too. Um, normally in the fall we get to go to the pumpkin patch and the Hartshorns are very generous with letting us come there and play and the students really enjoy the day. But the day we planned to go, uh, it had snowed and it was going to be muddy out there so we didn't go to the pumpkin patch. Instead the pumpkin patch came to us and we were able to have a pumpkin day and the students got to figure out how much the pumpkin weighed and how big a round it was and how many seeds were inside of it and they just had a lot of fun making a big old mess with their pumpkin. And upper grade students did it with lower grade students, and it was a lot of fun. Uh, we've had some helpers this year, and one of our helpers is Grandma Linda. You want to wave Grandma Linda? Anyway, we're always thrilled to have Grandma Linda come to our school. She's been helping us, um, giving us rides on field trips, helping us in our classroom, just any way she can find to help, and we're really grateful for Grandma Linda's help. We also want to thank Bev Maxson for donating her time and efforts in putting together hot lunches for our school a couple of times. The students are really thrilled when they have some delicious homemade macaroni and cheese or spaghetti to eat for their lunch. And that was really lovely of, of Bev to do that, and we're grateful. Um, we're grateful for all the support that you guys have been giving us. We're grateful for the um, uh, Michelle and her husband who have stepped up to the plate and done our fruit program for us. It's all online now. You can order fruit online. I believe there's some brochures at the back if you haven't ordered fruit yet. I think there's still time for you to do that. So we just want to thank you for your um, support of our school and for your continued prayers for our school. Um, it's not an easy job raising ch children these days. It takes a village to raise a child and we want to thank you for being a part of that village. If you feel so inclined to help us, uh, let us know. We have different things we can have you do. Uh, also, financial support is always really, uh, really needed for our school as well. We're hoping to eventually purchase some document cameras for our computers. That's one of the things that we're looking uh, into getting. So if you're interested in helping out in that way, that would be great too. But just thank you for your support and uh, your continued prayers for our church school. Uh, church school just doesn't happen. The product of a team, faith and love and sacrifice will fulfill us on this dream.
the history of his laws could give. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them for their children. Thank you so much for the music. Appreciate that. Well, it has uh, kind of come to the end for Jack and I as far as being here at the Liverpool Commons. I was trying to put this in perspective as I was sitting in the back and um, realized that when Jack and I got here, the sophomore class was born. Right on that? Our, our sophomore still around 15 years ago. I'm getting very little response. <laughs> Fair enough. So, hey, everything has perspective, and so it has been a real uh, pleasure being the not only Thomas president here, but the uh, chair of the K-12 board over those years to see uh, the school continue on, to see about 180 students graduate in those years that uh, we've been that is a real blessing uh, as I stand here before you today. I was asked to speak for Endowment Sabbath, and my understanding is that this will go out to the churches in the area and be used uh, on that Sabbath day. So as we start, I'd just like to ask the Lord to be with us one more time. Heavenly Father, my privilege to stand before the student body my privilege to share the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ today and the blessed hope we have in eternity. So be with us. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Joshua. The story of Joshua in the Old Testament is an amazing story, particularly as they neared the Jordan River. They'd been there for many years. No. A whole previous generation had been there. The parents of those that were there were there that day as Joshua led them. In fact, if you look at Joshua 3 in your Bibles, chapter 1, it says there, verse 1, it says, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. At the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they encouraged the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priest carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Go where? Well, obviously, the Bible says that uh, they would cross the Jordan River that day. As I said, they had been there before. Their parents, their grandparents, turned around and went back into the desert. Would this group have the courage? Would this group have the faith? Would this group have what it took to cross that day? The true story is that the moment the priest stepped into the water, just like at the Red Sea, almost the water backed up. And there, the priest walked into the middle and stood with the Ark of the Covenant as thousands of people walked by. I don't know how strong they must have been to stand and hold the Ark of the Covenant all that time as family after family went around on both sides of them and crossed the river. But something else took place that day that intrigues me and will always intrigue me because the Bible says that once everyone was across, the Lord spoke to Joshua and said, send one person from each of the tribes. And as you remember, there were 12 tribes. Go back into the middle of the river where the priests are standing and pick out 12 large stones, put them on your shoulder and bring them out to where we're going to camp. And so they did. They went into the river and they brought out the 12 large stones. And I like what it says here. And I, I share it out of the next chapter, chapter 4 of Joshua. And it says, And Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark, and the Lord your God in the middle of the Jordan. In other words, they go back to where the priests are still standing, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes. Of course, we know that was 12. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall 
say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant, when they crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel. And my Bible says forever. A memorial. Memorials are awesome. I am sad, to be honest with you, that some of the memorials in this country have been torn down. Some memorials are good, some memorials are not that good, but still they're memorials of a history of a nation or of a church or whatever it may be. We learn from memorials. And so it says here that when they took the stones out and they put them down, it says when your children ask, when your grandchildren, when generations ask later, what does this mean? You can tell them about the tremendous blessings that God bestowed upon them. And what happened here on that particular day. Stones as a memorial. Now, I was asked to tell a little of my story of Adventist education. But before I do that, I want to share with you that I, I was born and raised here in North Dakota. Not that far from here, about 100 miles, and on a farm, ranch, whatever you want to call it. And one day, and I have, uh, if I can find it here, I have a little memorial of my own. I don't know how many of you know what this is. It's a rock that was used by who? Native Americans. The Lakota Sioux, actually, would go across the land that we farm. My grandfather homesteaded. A, um, for those of you that have taken history, the Homestead Act would let you live on 160 acres and what they call prove up on it, another words, farm it, and then you can have it after so many years. But upon that property were stones that Native Americans had left behind. My brother actually got the best look at one. I got the other one. But uh, he had a, a nice white stone. It was more like what they used to call a tomahawk. That stone is a memorial of what? Of a culture? Of people who lived on the land before I did? It reminds me of their life, their culture, and who they were as a people. It's significant to me. Growing up in the Carrington, North Dakota area, if you go to a restaurant in Carrington right now, they have a lot of these kinds of along the airwaves and other stuff as a remembrance of a culture that used to be prevalent in the area. Also in Dakota, there were acts that were put forward by the territory, I think it's known as Dakota Territory at one time, and one of those was to set aside within every township, Dakota was very organized, in every township, Two sections of land were set aside for schools. And so section 16 and section 36 were set aside as school sections, and they would build little country schools on those pieces of land. And that's where the young people that grew up and farmed in the areas that uh, you know, didn't live in town, they would go to those little country schools. I had the privilege of spending at least four years in those schools before they took all the young people and put them on buses and took them to town to school. But um, during those years, and even before I was able to go to school, my two older brothers went to country schools most all of their first eight years. And my father, not being able to send us to a church school, tried his very best to get at his teachers to teach in those country schools. And so he would look for people who had teaching degrees to come and teach at that country school. Now, there was no place to rent an apartment. So he offered, my, my parents actually offered our house. We had a three bedroom house, at least that's the first one I remember. And one of those bedrooms was dedicated to the teacher. And the rest of us, my mom and dad slept in the other bedroom, and all of us kids in the third one. And 
So I can remember that so there were people like Ida Flemmer Lehman, who used to live in McCluskey. She lived in our house when I was first born and taught school in the area of my brothers. There was Jean Lang Carlson, who also taught school and lived in our house. There were twin sisters, Arla K. Unruh and Albert Ann Unruh, who one of them taught in the school that I went to and the other taught in the next school on that section here in that township, excuse me. So all of those people stayed in our house in the extra bedroom, as you call it, and taught school so that we could have an Adventist teacher. It was important to my parents. And I remember very clearly that when the country schools closed and they wanted to put us on bus and take us to Carrington. My parents talked a lot about the drive, which was close to 60 miles to Jamestown, which was the nearest church school. I remember sitting at the kitchen table and talking about what that might cost, what that might look like, what my mother would do all day if that happened, because going back and forth 60 miles each way twice a day to take me to school and to pick me up from school, it is the, but they struggled with it. They struggled with the importance, and, they, and I remember hearing them talk about it. It was important to them that their children be associated with that as education. Now, of course, the little country schools were fun. I have to admit it. I, I actually was almost a full year behind by the time I got to town, school in town. I did catch up, but it took a little doing. Because there were so many things to do at the country school, and I want to share a couple with you this morning. Uh, one, of course, my, uh, my two brothers went to the same school. One was uh, five years older, one was seven years older, so when I was a first grader, my oldest brother was in the eighth grade. And uh, we were across the road snaring gophers. I don't know if any of you have ever snared a gopher, but uh, we snared a gopher and about what you do with it once you have it. And so uh, my oldest brother took it into the school while the teacher was, I'm not sure where, and put it in her desk, <laughs> top drawer. And um, of course, there's this wild gopher loose in there. And uh, we were all excited to get back to, to the classroom to uh, see what was going to happen when she, because she always, you know, pulled her drawer open at some point. And so, you know, I'm six years old and I'm watching this take place. And it's going to be great. I know it's going to be great. And so uh, I'm sitting there and uh, there's about eight of us in the whole classroom. And I'm waiting for school to start and the teacher came in. Like nothing was going on. And some of us were giggling, of course, were kids. And she started the class. First thing she did was she said, Well, good year. And that particular school had uh, desktops to lift it up. She said, Open your desk and get out some kind of workbook, whatever it was we're supposed to get out. And as we opened our desks, guess what came out of my oldest brother's desk? The gopher came out, bounced off his chest, I remember that, and jumped on the floor, and they were, everybody was hollering and yelling. And and finally someone said, open the door, and out went the gopher. Now I'll never understand how she got her hands on that gopher without getting bit and getting him from her desk to his desk. But I always admired that teacher. <laughs> An awful lot. <laughs> because uh, she, was not, uh, she was not put off by that. It was also a different time. share one more about that little country school. The, the heat system was propane, which was a good thing, but the driver of the pro propane truck was not really adept, and he backed into the, the school and actually into the foundation of the school, and he knocked a hole in the concrete, and a skunk decided to move in that fall on the school. Well, you know how it is to have a skunk under your school. 
So uh, that had to go. So instead of uh, calling an exterminator or whatever, and this is how different times are, the teacher asked my older brother, oldest brother, who is, what, 13, to bring a gun and shoot the skunk. And he did. And we shot the skunk. Now the skunk, of course, before it passed on, um, sprayed the propane tank. Maybe kind of a yellow color. And um, that stunk for a few days, so school was called off for a few days until things got a little better. But I, I remember some of these things and how different cultures are and how different times are. Now you know people panic about guns and things like that. Uh, when I was a young boy, that was not a big issue. It, it was what it was. Going to school in town was quite a shock because going to two, school in town meant going from a school of six or eight children to 90 kids in one classroom. And of course, when they bust us all in to have that many in one classroom, I have to admit it was difficult. And of course, it had to be difficult for the teacher as well because we were at different levels from so many different schools and trying to figure out, you know, how everyone was doing and catching up with whatever it was, math or spelling or, or so many different things that took place there that I uh, felt sorry for the teacher. But I have to admit to that during those years at the Carrington Public School, I learned quite a bit of both good and not so good. Uh, it happens. And one of the things that kept a lot of young people out of trouble were sports. So early on, even in the fifth, sixth, seventh grade, uh, there were coaches for sports and uh, young people learned how to play basketball, do different things. There were parties after school, there were all of the things, yes, even when I grew up there were all those things. What was good for me was that I got on the school bus after school every day and went 16 miles home, which kept me busy as I got home and fed the cattle and for a while milk cows and a few other things that took place on our farm. But sports were something that I was good at and it was noticed during the PE class and so there was a real push to get me onto, especially the football team. The coach, football coach, talked to me often about playing football. In fact, he even promised to start me as a freshman when I was a freshman there on the, the uh, football team, not the B League, but what they called the A League at that time. That's pretty heavy stuff for a freshman. And um, I said I couldn't do it. He said, what are you talking about? You can't do it. I said, do you know, I go to church on Saturday. I said, well, that's fine. The games are on Friday night. I said, there's a problem, too. You see, we believe that when the sun goes down on Friday night, uh, the Sabbath begins. And Well, just, just go to your pastor, he said. I remember very well. He said, just go to your pastor and have him sign a piece of paper that says it's okay. I said, yeah. He said, the Catholic priest who had done different things for students and other pastors, just have your pastor go sign and say it's okay. I said, this works that way. Well, you know, I'm... 14 years old, and he's a grown man, and whatever, it's a little tough explaining. And so I, you know, he let it go that day, and uh, a few weeks later, I was in physical education class in the superintendent of schools, who was a uh, tall man, I remember his last name being Hanson, but he was a tall man, well-respected in the community, and, 
Yeah, he was walked into the gym while we were at a gym class, and uh, he watched for a while. And he called me over and he said, uh, "Why aren't you out for?" He said almost the same thing that my coach said. Well, just have your pastor do this and this. So it must have been a common thing I had for sports. I'm not quite sure. But it disturbed me that uh, not only the coach and the superintendent of schools for the Kirkland School District spoke to me on, uh, you know, he struggles, a young person. He wonders sometimes. But looking back, it made me a stronger person to say no. A better person. To say as much as I'd like to be part of that varsity football team. As much as I'd like to be part of all this in place. There is someone I need to respect. And my Bible says, that I need to respect Friday night, I need to respect Saturday or Sabbath. And so I have to admit that uh, after that freshman year, towards the end of the freshman year, I, I realized that I needed to get to the academy. <laughs> and I needed to be there. And I have to say today that uh, it was the best decision I ever made. Looking back, my time at Shine River Academy, which is the predecessor of this school, was a blessing to me, to my future. And the opportunities that came my way because of it, and the leadership that uh, I never would have gotten in public school, chances of leadership. I noticed most of you were involved in some form of leadership at your school here. Never would have had those in public school. Opportunities that would never come my way. I learned from all those things. I was blessed. Having spent time in the academy. I met young people who believed like I did. I met young people who became lifelong friends. Those stones, so to speak, the memorial of will be with me all my life. Because they have made a difference in my life. They have been powerful in my life. And just here, a couple of evenings ago, Jackie and I had a supper with a couple at the Olive Garden. We went to school with her. I went to school with her. Lifelong friends. I have to say today that all of the things that take place in one's life shapes their character. Who you are. The decisions you make about yes or no. What's most important to you? What do you hold dear? What is more important than, even, than maybe popularity or an athletic scholarship or whatever it is? What is really most important? You have to make that decision. And as people flounder around today looking for, as you look at the news and as you watch things happening on the streets, and they're looking for some, some direction in their life. I have to say to them, there is a direction. God laid it out long before any of us were born. A direction for life. It's an amazing thing. What God would have for us. What He has desired for us. What He has laid out for us. It's incredible. And sometimes the things that seem so important when we're young or whatever, you look back and you say, you know what? There's a bigger picture there. But I couldn't see it at the time. But God had a plan for me. And, and, it, and that plan... Awesome. Lord, where would you have me? Who would you have me be? If I could 
I say one thing to each of you when you look for that plan in your life. With God first. It make all the difference. It absolutely will. One of the sadder parts of looking back, I guess, could be
And I'm grateful that each one of you were here. I know some couldn't make it uh, this school year because of COVID and different things. But I'm glad you're here. I'm proud of you. I look forward to seeing your names if Jesus, like I said, if Jesus doesn't come soon. Seeing your names in the review or the outlook or who knows, some church magazine where you're doing great things for God. Because I know you can and you will. So blessings to each of you here today. Again, it has been my privilege to spend my last Sabbath conference present with the students of this school. Keep us faithful. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 